Um, we'll go ahead and get started with our introductions. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shaw Zakram, and I'm the Deputy Director at the Fulbright Association. Thanks for joining our career ser series for young professionals, especially created to support the newly returned Fulbright alum, as well as the young professionals in our network. The Fulbright Association is an independent nonprofit established in 1977 and represents 140,000 US alumni. Through our 54 lo local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year. We advocate for the program and promote international education. I would also now like to introduce my colleague, Lisa Boucher. Um, we are also going to be introducing our two speakers today, um, Andrew Evans and Liz Newman. We are very grateful for them to host these webinars for us. Andrew is a retired CFO from Wellesley College. He has served in the Foreign Service with USAID overseas and in Washington, DC, and later served as Associate Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He was on an Administrator Fulbright grant to the UK in 1992. Liz Newman has over 30 years of experience in financial management, organizational consulting, and executive search. With an established track record of serving clients in higher education, Liz is a trusted confidant and advisor to university presidents, provosts, and boards. She's also a recently retired managing partner at Koya Leadership Partners. Lisa? Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Boucher. I am the program manager at the Fulbright Association here in DC. I just wanna give you guys a few um, quick norms before we turn it over to Andy and Liz. If you can, just make sure you keep your microphone on mute so we can minimize any background noise. Uh, we also ask that you keep your cameras off if you can. It just helps maximize our bandwidth and make sure we don't have any technical errors. And uh, everyone's introducing themselves in the chat box, which is great. If you have questions along the way, you're welcome to use that same uh, function to write your questions and we will all be monitoring and um, answering those throughout. So. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Andy and Liz, and thanks for joining us. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today. We are very happy to see you. And um, since last week, Liz Newman and I have heard from a number of you who attended uh, our seminar, our webinar, and we really appreciated your interest and perhaps more importantly, your questions. So again, just to repeat uh, what you've heard, please post your questions on the Zoom chat feature. And uh, as we go through the various slides, uh, if, if you have a question, please raise it on the chat line, and then we will circle back at the end and answer those questions. So uh, Liz is sharing her screen, screen today, so many thanks to Liz. Um, the uh, seminar is broken up into four parts. There we go. And um, as I'm you know, not as good at Van, as Vanna White, I'm really sorry. <laughs> For those of you who know who Vanna is. Uh, thank you, Liz. Um, we really look, last week we focused on uh, finding, the, looking for the right job, how to launch your search. Today we're focusing on um, how you present your skills, highlighting your skills, resume preparation. Next week we'll focus on um, what to, uh, how to prepare a letter of interest and the application process, more on that. And then and finally session four is really prepping for the interview, hopefully that you get the interview and then talking a little bit about, about other parts of that, the references and uh, the actual dis discussions that take place uh, when you are hired. Going to the next slide, we, we, uh, last week, remember, we talked about locating job interviews, where to look, uh, evaluating, reviewing the position descriptions, trying to look carefully into those so that you understand the skills they're looking for. Um, again, fine tuning the search so that you're narrowing what you're actually looking for and then the importance of networking and informational interviews. So today we're going to focus on the uh, highlighting of your particular skills and how you put those skills in a way that, uh, in a resume that actually does describe all of your experiences and previous job responsibilities and be careful, being careful not to present too much detail, but uh, the right detail, what particular skills are important uh, resume, we'll talk about resume layout, how much personal information should be conveyed, and then what is the 
particular application process for the job you're applying for, and then some conversations around online applications. So uh, to talk about, uh, to launch this, uh, let's describe a little bit your current resume and what it's supposed to do. Your resume should be a standalone document that really tells your story. Create a document that um, is as effective to the reader if the reader scans it quickly or goes into great detail reading every single sentence, sentence by sentence, date by date, checking every entry. Um, your resume is really the first step in the process uh, for a recruiter and you want to be sure that you're telling your story the way you want it to be told. What you want to do, as, as Andy is saying, is make sure that the chronology is clear to anybody reading the resume. It's likely that people reading these resumes are reading a lot of resumes. So if there are lots of questions as they're reading it, um, it they don't maybe take it quite as seriously. So you, you may have gaps um, in your experience. You may have traveled abroad. You might have taken some time off between college or school and taking a job, you may have had personal circumstances that um, created gaps, or you may be working multiple jobs also. And all of that is valuable information for somebody to see on a resume. And as much as you can put it in chronologically, um, it's really helpful. And I, I think sometimes you think um, it's not valuable experience or something like that, but I think people reading resumes, people who are hiring are really interested in how you've spent your life. So I think it's, Andy and I think the more detailed you get in that and the more clear you are, the better it is. Um, also, if you're moving um, quickly from job to job, try to explain that transition. Um, you moved for a better job, your spouse or partner or family had to move to a different part of the country, so you needed to find a new position again, explaining some of the experiences and transitions that go on that have happened on your resume and maybe what skills um, were important to that as you made those transitions. You may have changed from one job to another to get a different skill set. It's fine to talk about that as well. Yeah, I think overall you want to make sure you don't leave anything to assumption on the part of the reader. I think that makes it more there's a greater chance that they will have the wrong assumption and you don't want that. This is again, your story to tell. Um, it's also really important to tailor the resume to the job or industry that you're applying for. And also if you have specific relevant skills that may not have seemed really important in the job that you had before or that you have currently uh, in terms of you're accomplishing that, but again, it could be important to the new job, make sure you call out those skills. So that's why it's very important to read carefully the position description and then relate those particular skills that you have had uh, to this particular new job. So I take the example of budget responsibilities. Maybe you had budget responsibilities in that old job. It wasn't a key part of the job at all uh, and that you were successful, you did it, but you were successful in sort of, in maybe in some cases in spite of that, but that budget responsibility, and especially in the coming years, being budget conscious will become a greater part of every single job, I can assure you of that. So as we enter this tough economy period, the fact that you have had budget responsibilities and been able to make, in some cases, difficult resource allocations that actually improve the work that you do will be very attractive. Um, this, other thing I wanted to mention is as you talk about particular responsibility, make sure that uh, that's in the job description, make sure that you use language that's in that job description. Uh, it may be the same kind of work, but you called it something different in your previous experience. So you had uh, responsibilities for financial management. Well, what is financial management? And if the new one's talking about can you run a budget of X size, whatever, make sure that you let them know that you have had that experience and even though it was called something else in the last, uh, in the last job. I think it's really important, again, to describe yourself of having specific skills and make sure that you're using the language that the employer is using uh, so that you are convincing to them that you have those particular skills. So I'm just going to add quickly to this, Andy, that um, we're focusing on the chronology. And in some instances, I'm just quickly seeing this in the chat, you may not think the job is relevant to the job you're applying for, but having the sequential chronology of where you have worked. So what you would probably do is not 
put as much information about that job or not highlight it as much as the jobs that were more relevant, but include it in the chronology so you're not having any gaps. I don't know, Andy, if you want to add to that. I'm seeing that question come up. Yeah, I think the only thing I want to add, Liz, is that um, the letter of interest is often a place where you can call out and uh, point uh, in your resume to particular areas of interest that you think the the uh, employer would like to know more about. So we'll talk more about that next week, but I think it's important to make sure that everything that you have done is in your resume and that you can, you know, again, uh, amplify that in the, in the context of the letter of application or the letter of interest as part of your application. So moving on to slide six. So people often ask us uh, how to, what's the best way to craft the, the various um, description of your responsibilities and accomplishments. And we, we have uh, surveyed our colleagues on this and um, in our previous roles and found that the most useful way to present is to use bullets rather than prose and to describe in those bullets your accomplishments through specific examples and specific numbers. So it's not a listing of tasks, uh, it's rather the kinds of skills you needed to employ to accomplish those tasks. So for example, I'll give you this example, uh, there are lots, but suppose you said, I partnered with two colleagues to implement a new program initiative in energy procurement uh, that required consultation and getting buy-in from eight departments resulting in energy conservation and savings of $25,000 over two years. Maybe too much information, but it's very specific about the kinds of skills that you had. You got buy-in, you were able to consult, you were able to focus on what was important in terms of energy conservation, and that over this period of time, two years, you, had, um, you achieved the cost savings that you were hopeful for. And I would say that um, there are others examples. Um, it, if you have not had sort of broad management experience within a department, it can be something, uh, perhaps in college, you were a, worked in the development division for them, and you made cold calls every week to potential donors and that you were able to achieve um, success with 10 to 12 donors every week and raise $20,000 during that particular semester. There's a way to put into these bullets enough data that is convincing to the reader that they need to ask more about that particular uh, experience that you have because it may be relevant to the work that they want you to do. You also want to show, just continuing in the next couple of bullets, you want to show movement either within an organization or between organizations. You took a job for a promotion uh, or within an organization, did you get promoted? Um, put all of this wording in positive actions. So um, maybe instead of talking about laying off people, you talk about um, retaining customers or successfully participating in a reorganization in a company, things like that. You want to think about it in terms of successes and positive wording. Um, um, also, I think um, using, if you don't feel that you let it, you can say you participated in it or you were supportive of it or you were part of an initiative, things like that. I mean, don't feel that just because you didn't lead it, that it isn't something that you were successful at doing and it, it still is an accomplishment on your resume. Um, using data effectively, percentages of budget increases, um, numbers of direct reports that you have, hiring that you might have done, dollars that you helped raise if you were in a fundraising position, um, reducing expenses, recruiting students, um, any kind of initiative um, so you're showing a skill set and then you're also set creating the example or showing the example of how that skill set was actually utilized in a position. Um, be as specific as you can. I see we're getting some questions about length of a resume as well. Um, I think for each position that you apply to, you want to take, highlight the initiatives or skills or expertise that are appropriate to that particular position. Um, one page is important. The longer you go in your career, it's not going to be one page. It may be one and a half or two pages. And it's all right. As long as you think it's succinct and complete, um, then it's okay to go beyond a page. Um, 
The next, the last bullet, Andy, I'm going to ask you to add to this as well. If there are things that you spend a lot of time doing, that's an important skill set like data analysis or crunching numbers or things like that, but it's not something that you really love doing. You want to highlight the expertise, but not maybe not, you know, overemphasize it as a skill set. Think you want to combine the skills that a physician wants and is looking for with the attributes that are important for you as you look to your next position. Yeah. So um, a couple of things I wanted to add related to these topics is um, one is the importance of if you have to speak a second or third language to accomplish the work that you do, uh, make sure you mention that, that you're uh, able to do that. Uh, and then um, what languages you actually speak can be listed in the context of your education section uh, of, the, of the resume. And that might be true also for any particular certifications that you needed to have in order to be able to accomplish it, that work that you did. So it's, uh, I, don't, I think it wasn't central maybe to the work, but it was critically important for you to be uh, successful on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I think you need to call that out. Uh, the second thing I noticed was part-time work that didn't seem central to the, the overall career aspirations that you have. So many recruiters like to see like, you know, I worked 25 hours a week doing X, Y, Z while I was enrolled in my master's program or at undergraduate level. Uh, and I did this because uh, I needed to um, further enhance my, my ability to have enough money to travel in the, it may be going to the Fulbright. So uh, that's, these are all important aspects of your character. And I think they're important to call out. If they're not really related to some aspect of the job, maybe you don't call it out. But I think you have, that's just where you have to really tailor it to the world that you're looking at. Right. Sometimes people put a section that says additional experience that, that is almost like showing your language or volunteer work or something like that. And then it's less a part of the active part of the resume when you're, that's a thought too. Right. Okay. All right. So the re people often ask us about the layout and um, we have sort of a, a general statement about that. Um, you will be evaluated in some ways, I'm sorry to say, you will be evaluated on how your resume looks. And that's how it's laid out, how easy it is to read, the formatting, the style, and maybe even the font. Uh, I didn't know there was such um, controversy over certain fonts, but it turns out there is. And uh, so you wanna make sure that, that uh, it's presented in a style that is pleasing to the reader. Um, it should be also visually attractive so that it, lined up correctly, it doesn't sort of run over, so it doesn't have to be done by a professional house, but you could certainly do it yourself uh, in, a, in a way that is attractive to the reader, visually attractive. Um, we have found that the straightforward format that's chronological is usually better than a design, an over-designed one. So sometimes you'll see bands across the top in different colors and a column down the right with different uh, skill sets that can be perceived as distracting. And uh, even though, unless it's for a job that's, that's very much a creative job that has a big part of creativity in it, um, we would probably encourage you to not be as creative and just be straightforward. The first read of this application or this resume can be very quick. So you wanna make sure that it's easy for the reader, not more complicated to try and find out whether you have that particular skill or whatever. You want them to be able to see it quite quite straightforward. And you want to send your resume in a PDF format. Uh, you don't want it to somehow be passed within the company and somehow gotten changed. So if it's in a PDF format, that, that is safer actually. And finally, the point here is that as you list your various uh, job responsibilities, make sure the way the information is presented, such as listing the position held, then the company name, and then the starting and ending dates when you held that particular position, Make sure that's consistent from job to job. So that you always start with the name of the position, then the company name, and then the, the dates that you were there. And then it's more pleasing, easier to read. And again, you wanna make sure that the reader is not having to stumble around and try and find out information, rather it's presented in a, in a chronological, easy to read format. And just a quick add on while we're talking about this, this is a, a little more piece of detail. Um, 
I really appreciate it when people describe the company where they've worked, um, what industry it's in, um, maybe the size of it or something like that, that gives the context to the company. Even uh, again, if people are looking at a lot of resumes, it's nice that you gave thought to, I worked in this division of this multi-million dollar company or whatever it is. I just think it adds context to the resume. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's go on to the next slide there. Resume layout, Liz. Yep, I just did. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I have my chats up here. Hold on. <laughs> so um, you want to be consistent in your language. If you're setting up bullets, you want to start with, I think you should start with an action, a verb, something that says created, supported, implemented, participated in but be consistent throughout your resume. Sometimes it's what's really hard is you start going to the thesaurus or something to figure out what's a different word that you can use. I think it's more important just to even, even to continue to use words that show the actions that you took. Um, uh, proofread it very carefully, have somebody else proofread it, send the PDF to someone and have them send it to you so when you open it, you see what it looks like when somebody else opens it. Uh, just because you, you, first of all, once you've written it, you're seeing things that you think are there that may not be there. So make sure somebody objective takes a look at it and reviews it. Um, some of the questions that come up, I've seen this either a summary or an objective. Um, I tend to, somebody said this in the chat, I don't find a huge amount of value in it. I think it's absolutely, it's, it's actually probably not necessary and it does take up space. We have seen if you're transitioning from one career to another, like if you were a part-time fundraiser while you were in school and you're looking to get into another area, that um, doing an objective that shows the interest in that transition could be valuable. Um, I, I think, again, it depends upon what you're applying for and what you want to accomplish by using it. If you are just kind of repeating the skill set that's in the position description, I don't think it adds a lot of value to the resume. I don't know if you want to add to that, Andy. No, I'm, I'm good there. Um, and people are asking for samples. So um, I spent some interesting time <laughs> this past week. I actually applied for a job on Indeed.com. Um, and there are so many great samples out there. It's crazy to think that we would be able to provide them with you. If you Google, as this says, writing a resume, you'll get a lot of samples. And even as you like I applied for a, a COVID tracing job here in Boston and um, they actually get, immediately gave me advice on my resume. And so, and I wasn't asking for it necessarily. So there are all kinds of really great advice and I would use that type of information. I think it's current. I also think um, how, you, how you put your resume together says something about you as well, and you want to keep that in mind as you're doing it. So don't lose sight of who you are and what's important to you as you're putting it together. Um, and then the other piece, somebody actually asked us about this over the last week, is a CV, curriculum vitae, is an academic resume. So if you are a faculty member or a teacher or a researcher, you have a resume that lists all the articles you've done, the research you've done, PH students you've had, all of that stuff is critical to a longer resume like that. And um, it's a different format. And um, it's, I think you still have a chronology in the beginning and then all of that detail in the back. Um, I th think we, I said this earlier, um, I wouldn't get stuck on fitting everything on one page. I wouldn't reduce the font size to do that, by the way, or the spacing. Um, if you think you've got all the information you need and it goes over into another page, then I think you should have more than a page. Andy, do you want to add anything to that? The only thing I would add is, again, this is being sensitive to the, uh, the industry you're applying to, if you're applying to a group that's very environmentally conscious, make sure your resume is double sided as opposed to single page. Uh, that that's makes sense. Someone also asked on the line here about uh, certifications that they weren't able to get the, the final certification. So then you say it in a different way. I think I definitely would not drop it, but keep it and say uh, 40 hours of online training uh, that uh, further my education in X, Y, Z, something like that. People can recognize that doesn't necessarily have to be a certification, but if it was a serious effort 
on your part to gain a new skill or, or knowledge of some particular area, go ahead and list it. I think it, especially in these times, people want to see that you're continuing to be active in your education about furthering some particular knowledge of, a, of an area that you're interested in or hoping you're aspiring to. And the, somebody had just said their CV, their academic CV is over 15 patients. That's totally, it, it's, it's realistic. You've done a lot of publications or you've presented at conferences or, you know, if you're a researcher, you might have patents or grants that you've gotten. That is what that is for. And it's a little different and it all needs to be there if you're applying for that kind of a job. If you are not applying for an academic job, think about how you present the chronology with that information, maybe as an addendum, as it's relevant to the job you're presenting, but giving people an opportunity to look at what the history of your work that applies to the job you're applying to, again, if it's not an academic job. Right. I think that's a very important point. We have seen addendums used very creatively and, yep. and very helpful. And you, you know, the, the first read doesn't really go that deep, but then the second or third read, you would go way into that, maybe actually look at some of those publications. So okay. um, right. I think that's very good advice. Yeah. yeah. So next, how much personal information should be conveyed? Um, I, we have surveyed folks that we worked with. Um, pictures on resumes are really not a good thing. Um, just it's a I would say it's a non-starter it also probably takes up space that you don't want to take up um, but you do want to put a picture on your LinkedIn page please do not leave that blank you know you get that little Lego head thing that comes up if you don't have a picture um, but think about um, a LinkedIn picture Andy and I had a, a fairly long conversation about this so um, Think about what you're wearing, what the scene is. This is a professional page. It's not a Facebook page. Um, and so I think you have to be, I would say thoughtful is the word that we came up with, maybe even slightly conservative about how, what that picture looks like and what it shows. It depends upon what industry you're in, where you wanna be, all of that type of thing. But think about it as a professional presentation in addition to your resume. And that's the picture that recruiters will see if they're going to look at your LinkedIn page. Um, contact information. Um, I also will say apply the, the dress code to interviews. We're going to talk about that in a future session, but I just want to give you that little heads up on that, whether you're doing it on Zoom or webinar or in person. Um, Contact information to include, keep it very simple, not multiple, your name, city and state that you live in, um, the email address that you wanna be contacted at, the phone number, probably a cell phone that you wanna be contacted and your LinkedIn page as well. So you're looking to provide, again, the recruiter with a very quick way to be able to be in touch with you. You wanna make sure also um, look at what your email address is. Um, what's your voicemail on your phone? Think about those things. These are going to be, I mean, we've actually seen people change their email addresses to just be their name versus maybe a nickname or something that they had in college. So think about that as you're putting that in place. Um, Liz, um, I'll interrupt you for a second. Yeah, Only please. to say that um, try not to, uh, don't, I would say, use any um, stationary or uh, other kind of information that shows your current employer. So do not send in a resume that's on the letterhead of your current uh, uh, yeah. place of employment. Um, people will sometimes ask, oh, have they been let go and they're allowing them to do outplacement or something. You don't want people to make any assumptions about it. So keep it plain white paper your name and address uh, at the top, the, the limited address that Liz just described. Um, and again, just to e emphasize that if your email, your typical email is your work email, think about having one that is not work not email for personal. this particular uh, personal uh, uh, conversations that you're gonna have about uh, your next employment. I think there are also ways to indicate, I mean, there are a couple, if, if you're willing to move and you're applying to jobs that aren't in your geographic location, um, 
it probably is going to come up in the letter of interest, but I think recruiters do make the assumption if you're applying that you are willing to move. So, but it, it, it's, um, yeah, I don't know. And I think in the letter of interest is probably the best place to address that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'm just going to add here is a note of caution. And this actually was something that I had not really thought about, but I, it was a point of, of interest to me when I was on indeed.com. Um, be really careful about scam jobs or weird email addresses. So when you find a job that you want to apply to, what you might want to do is Google and research that company to make sure it's legitimate. Um, you're sending your information out there and you are sending an email address and a phone number and an at, you know, at least a city and a state. So you want to be really careful about where you're applying and just double check it to make sure it's legitimate. There were um, two other questions uh, that I saw that I, I think we need to address. And one is, uh, when is it time to take off your college leadership positions? Yep. Um, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, if you're within 10 years of college, I think it's probably okay to keep some of that on there, but I would limit it very, very uh, carefully. So if you were the president of a 10,000 uh, student body, uh, you were an elected uh, president, uh, that's an important piece in your college information. You can put that uh, right next to your college uh, information that you're listing. Um, it shows a lot of a lot of things, and I think that would be of interest to to employers that you know how to uh, work with a a great a great number of different views in a student body. So I think that that would be important. That's a skill that you've picked up. Um, someone also asked also about uh, unrelated to that is a um, contextualizing. Yeah, well, objective at the top. Should I should I put a put a list an objective at the top? And um, I want to just go back on that and say, you have to be careful with that. If you sort of put something up there that's a very glowing statement, it can put people off. If you're saying, I had a great Fulbright experience, I'm now returning to the United States and I'm looking for work in this, or not looking for work, but I'm uh, uh, seeking a career that addresses environmental concerns or something like that, something very broad. Um, and don't make it a list of superlatives of how, what a great leader you are and strategic <laughs> vision. That turns people off, quite honestly. So you t I mentioned contextualizing the company. So um, I, I would list the, it, it can be one sentence. It can be three items, and it probably relates to the job you're applying to. But let's say you worked at a small startup. It's a name that somebody as a recruiter may not be familiar with. So startup firm in medical technology, 15 people, I, just something that gives a um, million dollar grant or research, you know, research company, whatever gives context to the company, because there are a lot of small companies out there. I, I just, I know so many times that people don't understand the type of company you're working at. They, it's, it doesn't add, it, it doesn't help the context of your experience. Yep. Okay. Um, let's go on in the slides and we'll circle back to more questions. So I'm on, uh, how much personal, how much personal information. information should be yep. conveyed? Liz. Yeah. So if pronouns are important to you, put them on the resume. Um, it's certainly something that we see in a lot of people's email signatures as well. That's one place to think about putting it if you're sending an application that way. Um, it's something that's clearly very important now. So please feel free to do that. Um, hobbies and interests. Um, yeah. I, I think this is, I'm sorry, Andy, that's yours. <laughs> well, no, it's better, right? <laughs> we have the same opinion. I think it's that if sharing this information rounds out your candidacy for this particular role and it might trigger a positive reaction, do it. Put it in. It's a possible connection, point of connection, also important. But if it does not tell the reader anything about you that you think or that is really relevant, then probably not. Don't put it in. Um, it's really, I think, whether it's appropriate for this role and add somehow to your candidacy for this particular role. So a couple of quick questions I see here. So if you're applying um, to a position in your hometown, um, it's probably not a bad idea to list your high school. Yeah. Um, then they, people see the relevance of it. Um, opportunities to discuss new short-term 
contract type positions, I think you need to include them as exactly that, actually. And if it's what you're currently doing, maybe that's how you put it. I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with identifying this time of transition and how you fill the time with either short-term, part-time, volunteer, you know, hourly jobs for money, whatever it is. It's a, and each situation, I think, is going to be a little different in how you show it on your resume. Absolutely. Okay, so going to the next slide then, what's the application process for the job you're applying for? This is really important because they, the processes vary. And um, as we mentioned last week, getting to know more about that uh, process um, and whether it's for grad school or an internship or a volunteer role or paid position at a nonprofit or a paid position at a for-profit company, um, getting to know more about the application process will be helpful and critical to being successful as you move forward. And so it's really gathering that information about what's, what it is uh, in the process. And then um, preparing the resume. So Liz. Yeah, that's all right. We're stepping over each other now. Yeah. So I think what you've heard us say is um, the resume really requires you to reflect on your own experiences, your education, what's important for you in terms of your next position, and what's important for the people who are looking at your resumes for this next position to understand about you. So, I mean, the example that we use here is your GPA um, may be important depending if you're applying to a graduate program or something like that. It may not be important if you're applying for a job in an NGO, not-for-profit, for-profit. Um, so I, I even asked somebody the context of this. I mean, sometimes we, even with senior people, have listed information that doesn't really seem relevant. And so sometimes people question why you add certain information, like why do I need to know your GBA score if, I'm, if, if, if it's not relevant to the position that we're looking at? I think that's what we're trying to say. What's relevant to the position? What's important information that people need to know um, about you um, that will pique their interest? Yeah. Um, and then, um, th and this is um, the Indeed piece. So um, I really did want to be considered for being a COVID tracer uh, in, in Massachusetts. And that is why I applied for it. And Indeed.com was the search site that is um, screening for those jobs. So I learned very quickly, um, one, that resume is important, but they very quickly ask you about your skill sets. What's, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have that? And I think they're doing a couple of things that may relate to the specific job I'm applying to, but they're probably also trying to get information about me in their database so that if there are other jobs that might seem similar, they would be able to, they would know immediately that I might be a person to contact. And I think there's a pro and a con to this. You don't want to be scammed. You're applying for a director of this at a company and all of a sudden you get an email from that company for a completely different job. Just be very careful to watch that. It may not be a job you're interested in. So once they've got your data, they're going to start peppering you with other types of positions. But it also helped me think about the experiences I did or didn't have or wanted or didn't want in particular jobs. And so I think it's a really interesting exercise to go through it. And I suspect that a lot of people are doing this now. They, they are responsive, they are helpful. Um, they actually have assessment tools that you can take. My guess is if you do some of that, it probably ticks you up on the list of people that they might refer jobs to potentially. So, um, but it's, it's important to be specific about who you are and what you want and concise about the information about you. I mean, in some instances, you can simply upload your resume, but in other instances, you can add more context to it. Yeah, I think it does. Uh, I think it's wise to probably pay a little more close attention to the process of how they're entering, how you enter the information and to not just jump in and put the information, but actually think through what they're actually asking you to do. Uh, and as Liz pointed out, there may be key words that they're looking for and uh, electronically they'll be scanning the information that you're putting in to see whether that's a match or not. Um, so again, go back to the position description and make sure that you're using the same language uh, in order that, you know, you might surface as a, an appropriate candidate. 
Um, I have two other thoughts I wanted to mention. One was a question we had here about sectioning your resume, about whether to put professional experience, education, and awards. I think that's yes, that's a yes. And then within that, it's chronological. Um, so you, and you would, you can either put your information, your educational uh, information at the start near the top or at the bottom, we see it always, that is not as important. But um, just making sure that it is chronological, I think in terms of dates, uh, when you got a certain degree, um, it can go both ways. If you're my age, you maybe don't want to put the degree in that you graduated in 1972, seems like ancient history. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if you were there in the, the early 2000s and someone else uh, that's reading this resume was also there and working on that particular issue as well, that's a connection. So I think you have to sort of weigh that kind of carefully. So you're and asking, so, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead, Liz. There's, you're asking for more detail on hobbies or points of interest. So um, I thought about this a lot. So let's say you are a swimmer and you are coaching elementary school swim team. Um, and that's what you consider a hobby or something you do in your spare time. That shows leadership. It shows a lot of different skills that are, I think, relevant to any job search. Um, you're a runner, uh, you may want to show that if that's if you run marathons or something like that. Um, I, so I think it's the context of what does that additional information show about you as a person? Um, you love to read, maybe that is something that's really important to a particular position. So I think again, I mean, what I, what I would do, this is how I would approach this. Thankfully, I don't have to do a resume anymore yet, maybe not. Um, I would list all the things that are my hobbies or skills or interests outside of what I do in my career and sort of think, what, how does this add to who I am as I'm applying for this job? Some may be more important than others. Some you may want to bring up in an interview even, maybe not on a resume necessarily. Again, you're looking for the length of the resume and the relevance of information um, to the job that you're applying for. Yeah. Um, one other thought we didn't mention, but, um, and Liz sort of touched on, I think, in terms of being scammed, uh, you are all very capable people. Um, there's no really reason to pay anyone to find you a job. And I think that's not as popular as it used to be, but just be cautious about that, that someone you get sort of pulled in and then they say, well, we're going to that your resume and then shop it around and you'll pay us $1,500, whatever, don't do that. You can, you, you have every bit of capability to be able to do that yourself. So um, here's a question, Andy, I think we both probably have um, context of uh, con comments on um, how and when do we differentiate salaried versus lab hourly wage positions roles we fulfilled that were primarily funded by external fellowships that we secured, um, where we would put consulting that's non-remunerated. Um, my sense is, it, it, I, it, I think it depends, and I don't like using that answer, but it may depend upon the position you are applying for. Some of it could be under additional experience or volunteer work areas like that. Um, if it's important to the chronology of your resume, um, I'm not sure you actually have to indicate salaried or hourly necessarily, but maybe a consulting job or maybe it was a part-time job. You know, the, that's the, the context to me more importantly is what you were doing where and what your impact was versus whether it was sal salary or hourly. Yeah. I think the other thing that on that point I would say is that if you work say at uh, a large uh, biotech firm in Boston and you had to participate in raising your salary every year. Uh, that's not the first bullet you put in that in that section, but maybe the last bullet that you were required uh, over this period of time to raise X thousands in order to support the work that uh, you were doing, that kind of thing. People would appreciate that. So we have a couple of repeats. I think you should list volunteer work, whether you have a certification from that company or not, if you did yeah. that volunteer work. Um, you can always use a reference from that place, if that makes sense at some point in the, in the job process. But if you've 
been doing volunteer work somewhere, I think you should list it. Um, education awards, certifications, language skills. I kind of, again, it, it seems to me under education, you list your degrees and then maybe you list the languages. Somebody asked about level of language. I've seen people who say fluid in French, I know a little bit of Spanish or, or you know, beginner Spanish, limited Spanish, something like that. Um, I would be careful to list. I mean, if you really are very limited, maybe you don't want to list it, but, you know, think, so list the level of experience in your language. And I think sort of in that education area, what do you think, Andy? Yeah, I think it relates also to um, the, the position that you had. So having lived in Indonesia for two years, I studied Indonesian, but now some years later, my Indonesian is nowhere near what it was 20 years right. ago. So I think you would say some familiarity with Indonesian, Farsi, and so on. And, and that sort of lets the reader know that you maybe are culturally sensitive because you've actually lived or worked in that particular country and you had to speak the language on a day to day basis in order to get around. I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and other certifications. So maybe you took a, I don't know, a computer programming or database program or things like that. I mean, that, I think you list that there is as, you know, additional certifications. If you are in the process of getting a master's or a PhD, make sure you list that you're maybe you're doing it part time or you're in process. Expected date of completion. Be very clear if you are, if you have not written a dissertation and you're in a PhD program, noted as ABD, all but dissertation, or expected date of completion. Those are things um, that that recruiters check. I mean, they they do check the things that they can fairly easily check through the National Clearinghouse and places like that. They're, so just be really specific about where you're at in those programs. I not, think you should include dates for graduation. Yeah. I mean, people, people try and count the age if you don't include it, frankly. So right. just include your dates. Yeah, I think it's really important. It's likely that you'll be asked a question if you get to the interview stage and it says, says that you are expected completion of this particular degree in 21, 2021. Well, they'll sort of wonder, well, how are you accomplishing all this? How are you going to accomplish all this in the context of doing this very uh, intensive work for this job that requires a lot of travel, for example? So um, I think you just have to be cautious about what you're listing and how you and then have an answer for a question like that like that. So one question is, is the application portal asks for descriptions of each experience. Is it okay to copy this directly from the resume? Um, if you've tailored it to that job, absolutely. It's perfectly fine to do that. Yeah. Somebody asked, I'm not exactly clear on this. Um, somebody, as I was talking about the contract tracer positions, found the CDC Foundation Job Hub for National Positions. Um, do we need to be concerned with the same issues you described with Indeed about entering your information and things like that? I think it would be similar, yes. I mean, I haven't looked at it, so I don't know how it works, but it's almost as if the care that you take in putting this resume together and making it relevant to a particular position is the same care as you're going into these search engine sites. And it's easy just to start checking stuff off and it's, I mean, the one of the things that I struggled with, and this is probably age specific, is I felt like I was just looking at a little piece of what they needed to know as I was going through the process. So step back and just make sure that what you're completing and filling in and adding adds up to something that looks like your resume, is your resume, or adds to your resume. Yeah. I would also, there's a question about um, publication. Uh, that the person here has um, published in an art history journal, and that's not necessarily relevant to the particular job that this person's looking at. Um, I think it's okay to list that because it shows, first of all, uh, getting published is no easy task. Uh, it requires a great deal of effort and time. So put it chronologically with that, uh, maybe it was why you were pursuing your undergraduate or graduate level of education. Put it in that section and then just add underneath um, successful in, in getting published in XYZ art history journal. People will see that and say this person can write or this person's uh, done a, a, an extensive research project and that that will be of value. But it's not 
it, it's, it's sort of like additional that may be of context in context uh, of what this job is looking for, uh, a, a piece of important information. So I'll just repeat, somebody's asking about a master's degree in process. Um, I would put that it's in process, what you're getting it in and when do your expected um, completion date is. Um, how can we add new work experiences to our resume when, we, when not knowing exactly what our responsibilities will be? Um, it's assuming you got the job, but you haven't started it yet. Is that what you're reading in that? Yeah, I'm reading something different. I'm reading okay. that um, not knowing what the responsibilities of the job will be, but how to add stuff that might be relevant. So I think I, see what, yeah. uh, I, think I would just sort of uh, be broad on that. I wouldn't necessarily try and tailor it as much as you might want to or be able to later. Um, again, consistency. So if you have a LinkedIn mm -hmm. profile, and you're submitting a resume, make sure that all the dates match up and make sure that the titles of the jobs are the same and make sure that the education in, on your LinkedIn page is exactly the same as the, the degree description in, uh, in your resume. Um, both of us, Liz and I, have both had experiences where they didn't match, which led to further questioning and found out that it wasn't really quite that degree. And, um, just be very straightforward and make sure that everything is consistent. Yeah, and I would also say there are areas not unlike on a resume where you can put objectives or summary or um, things like that. And I think, it, I think it's actually great to have it on LinkedIn. I just, if the person, if a recruiter is looking at your resume and LinkedIn, again, consistency there. So, um, I mean, it, it can be changed, obviously. But I also think the value of LinkedIn is groups. Um, you can get people to, to um, refer you to people. Um, it, it's, it's pretty amazing to me. I, I think in some ways it's a more personal database for networking than an indeed.com where really they're just looking to upload your information into a, a huge database for people to to get hired from it's it's a it's a more sophisticated piece for that which i think is kind of exciting actually um someone asked here about uh having more than one position in an institution and how to list that so if chronologically they all fit together so you started there in 2000 and for two years you were an accountant then you moved to be a senior accountant then you moved to be the deputy controller and then you moved to be the controller you can list all those positions more importantly list what it was about your uh, success or accomplishments in those positions because it may represent a 10 year period of your career and you wanna make sure that you have covered and people can see that it was the result of your accomplishments that really got you promoted to the next job within that institution. I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, listing that. Sometimes people will put a number of positions and not put that information and then sort of uh, group all of the responsibilities that happened during that period of time. I think that's okay too. So I got the clarification on the CDD, CDC okay, foundation. So first let me say, I believe on anything like career builder or indeed you have to agree to be considered for other jobs. There's a little check off somewhere that you have to do that. And I suspect that you're right, that that isn't what's happening on the CDC. You apply for a specific job, um, and that's the job that they look at you for, unless maybe they also ask that question. You know, would you, would you be interested in being considered for other jobs? I, I think that's how it works out on Indeed. Yeah. There's a question here about um, using your Fulbright mail uh, as your, whether we should consider it a work email or not. I think that's fine to use that as a regular email, personal email. As, uh, it, you got that email as a result of traveling somewhere and it was important for you to have access to uh, that particular um, email account, no matter where you were. So it was both personal and professional. I think there's nothing wrong with using that. That's not a problem. Um, how long should we list relevant experience? So this is my, I, I like to know all of it. I think 10 years in detail, and then maybe you put additional experience and you list the companies and the titles and the years you worked there. Um, I, it's, I, I think it's just, it shows a progression. 
And I like seeing that even if you've changed careers or, you know, gone back to school or something like that. I, I like to see it. But I think you would expect the most recent jobs to be the details that you would list and probably not go back more than 10 years on that type of detail. Right. Someone asked a question here about the grant that you were um, working under expired, but you're still working on that particular project. Should you list the end of the grant date? I would list the period of the grant date and then uh, say continuing to work on this project um, and that it's current or something like that. Uh, just it's it's just easier if you if you specify what the current condition is. I can There's another. There's another question about networking. I think that Shaz and Lisa and maybe Andy can talk more about the Fulbright network. I can't say enough about networking. I think you are always networking and building relationships, whether you're looking, whether you're in a job. I just think it's hugely, hugely important and. Um, there are ways to network within your community. There are ways to ask people to introduce you. Like if you know somebody at a company that you're linked in with and that's a company you're interested with, they could introduce you. Um, we did spend a bit of time on this on the last session, but really um, building relationships, thinking about relationships now that you had in college or with your family or volunteer jobs, anything is a relationship. and building on that, seeking advice about it, um, not necessarily asking people for a job, but asking them for advice and beginning to let them understand who you are and what you might be good at. So I noticed we're over time and I okay. want to thank everyone. Um, if you have additional questions, please send them. If you felt that we didn't really get to your quick question, uh, send us um, an additional email. Uh, we have um, listed our contact information at the end of this presentation. And, and Lisa is going to follow up with emails to everybody. So please be in touch. We'd yeah. love it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good. Good to be here. Yeah. Bye everyone.